for those who are watching the program right now on Ustream, it's uh, a blessing to uh, have you uh, with us this evening. Again, as we said earlier this morning, all the equipment that was necessary to have, or the hard drive necessary uh, to uh, teach from Revelation is uh, sitting on the dining room table, so we opted for Plan B, which is, of course, more Bible. And in this case, we're looking at Romans chapter uh, chapter 6, um, a, a prevalent message. And I also want to say something about this morning's message. Uh, I was talking about utilizing uh, the, the camera on the, the laptop plus the uh, audio recording because I said that there was less of a problem in regards to uh, crashing if I use the laptop and of course the laptop crashed so so much for that theory so now we're back to the iPad format for the moment I'm not sure if this TV thing is a good idea or not because there's a lot that uh, goes into it and when I was a uh, full-time pastor I'm not now by any stretch of the imagination um, I had far superior and different equipment and I don't think we crashed, but maybe once or twice ever. Uh, so we had things set up in such a way where we could uh, do this without much of a problem. Uh, but with advanced, advanced technology come also advances uh, in problems too. Uh, having said that, uh, let's go back to Romans chapter 6, because that's where we left off today. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Um, Paul's answer is, God forbid. Um, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I did put the audio message up, so the full message on audio is on the, on the Facebook page. So if you don't get but half the video, and you're not going to get but half the video because of the aforementioned issues, uh, the audio message is in full uh, on the Facebook page. You can hear the whole thing. And I recommend doing that too because um, what we're going to talk about this evening may not make much sense because I'm not going to go into much uh, uh, much of review here because, like I said, this is just a message that's kind of filling for my uh, leaving the material by mistake at home. But it's definitely a relative message to all of us. But I will say this much. Um, Grace does not encourage or promote believers to sin. That's one. Uh, sin does not promote, produce grace. That's number two. And we do not need to sin to experience God's grace because believers are already standing in grace every moment of every day because of our relationship with God the Father through Christ. So those important points, you want to go back and listen to the original message this morning, and then all this will make perfect sense to you. So we have experienced grace in full. You know, I'm answering the question that Paul asked and answered um, the, the lie that not only is prevalent in Paul's day, but also in our day, sad to say, was that since grace supervounds over sin, then let's just keep sinning that we may experience more grace. Um, that makes no sense at all, um, but people still uh, teach and believe that ridiculous nonsense even to this day. And my thought again is believers are already standing in the fullness of the grace of God every moment of every day because of our relationship uh, with God the Father through Christ. So to say or to imply that sinning is a means to experience more grace or grace, period, is itself sin and ridiculous. We went back to Romans chapter 5, looked at verses 1 and 2. Uh, verse, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we already have and, and are and will experience grace in full because of our position in Christ. So sinning more does not add to grace because we are already standing in full in grace forever. So is that clear? I want us to understand that. 
Next time you run into someone who tries to imply that you can experience, and you do run into these people, they may not come out and say it in that, in that fashion, but you do run into those people. They are very subtle about it, they are very defensive of their sins, and they want to attach their sinfulness to the grace of God. When you run into those kinds of people, you need to understand who you're dealing with. You're dealing with someone who may not be a believer at all, and the high possibility is they're not, because anyone who thinks that they can experience more of the grace of God through sinning, Paul said of that person, his damnation is just. Now, do you want to be that kind of person? I don't think so. And if we know people like that, we don't want them to be that way either, so we have to help them to understand what the Bible actually says, because we're responsible if, if people in our sphere, we don't want uh, them by any means to be uh, deceived because of ignorance. Now, if they're deceived by choice, there's nothing you can do about it. If they're deceived because of their ignorance, that's a whole different story. I gave you an illustration today. I won't go into that uh, this evening. So in conclusion, back to Romans 6, to the question in chapter 6, verse 1, what could be the only possible answer? He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He says, God forbid, or uh, the translation is, may it never be. May something like this never come into existence. That's how strong the mentality should be about the issue of, shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That's not talking about the sinner. That's talking about the professing believer that has already experienced the grace of God. Shall we, who have experienced that grace, continue in sin with the ridiculous notion that there's going to be a superabounding grace? Uh, may, may that thought never even come into existence. That, that's something we shouldn't even contemplate at all. Because why? The person who is justified in Christ has a new relationship to the sinful nature in that he or she is no longer under its power to render slaves obedience to it. Not only that, we're dead from serving that old nature because we are a new creation in Christ. We shouldn't be defending sin. We shouldn't be defending sin. We should be, the, the position of the believer is repentance. It's not defending sin. It's not calling people judges or Pharisees or whatever sundry um, bunches of stupid name calling we get ourselves involved in to defend sin. There's no such thing as defending sin in Scripture. And it just seems like people keep forgetting Jesus died for sin. He didn't die for us to stay there. He died for us to get out of there. Or else, why have a salvation? What are you being delivered from? What is salvation if it's not being delivered from sin? That I means it's ridiculous to think that it's not. And having been delivered from it, do you think that the grace of God will lead you back into it? The whole, the whole thought of that is absurd. It's an absurdity. We are dead to it. We do not have to live in obedience to it any longer because we have the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And as I said earlier, the idea that the Holy Spirit does everything except this is ridiculous. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. And I know I get a lot of complaints, and you know I've, I've learned not to really care much about that. The issue is, what does the Bible say? And the issue here is, what is the number one work of the Holy Spirit throughout the New Testament? It's not tongues. It's new life in Christ. It's new life in Christ. You know that a person is filled, anointed, whatever title you want to put on it, with the Holy Spirit when you see new life in Christ. There's a lot of folks running around speaking in gibberish that have no new life, yet they claim to be walking in the Spirit. Well, they're not. They claim to be speaking in tongues. They're not. They're speaking nonsense and gibberish. The bottom line is, how are they living? Um, how in the world we can have the Holy Spirit and live the exact opposite of that is absurd because the power of God in us is for the purpose of making us holy. Not only that, we're commanded to be holy. Both Testaments teach that for the Jews and for the church. Be holy, for I am holy. And Peter goes on to say that God is not partial at all. 
be holy, for I am holy. That's a commandment. You don't need any other reason. None of us do. So we do not have to live in sin at all. We do not have to obey its lust any longer. Well, you don't understand. See, that kind of person is the most dangerous person to hang around. That person needs to be rebuked in the faith. That person does not need to be coddled in sin. We coddle people too much. We're trying to befriend them. We're not doing them any favors by doing it. They need to be rebuked soundly in the faith. That's the biblical teaching. I would hope that if ever, if ever I'm in some kind of sin, that somebody would come up and do exactly that. I expect that. I don't expect someone to go, oh, pastor, we're all human. I'm liable to backhand you for saying something so ridiculous as that. That's just crazy talk. What do you expect me to be? A dog tomorrow? I'm always going to be a human being. And that's not the point anyway. Now, notice this important fact in verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How or in what way, shape, form, or fashion shall we who have died to sin live grammatically in the future tense in the same? This is, this is I said earlier, this is Christianity 101. You have to operate under this very singular, clear premise. Christianity changed your position with God, the Father, with the Spirit, and with the Son of God, and it changed your relationship to sin. If you don't get this, and this is very basic, very simple, Christianity 101, uh, I hate to be the, the bearer of bad news, but you don't have an idea what you're talking about when it comes to salvation. That's why I said that the, the number one thing of the church that just irks me, and still us to this day, is this willful, colossal ignorance of the Word of God. She just simply doesn't want to study the Word of God. She just wants to rally around her favorite Bible buds and feel real good about it, knowing nothing. I mean, I'm impressed how much time is spent around listening to Bible teachers and not listening to God in His own Word. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed at that. I would guarantee if we spend as much time doing whatever we do, spending it in the Word, we'd be a lot our attitude, our lives will change dramatically. The word live in verse 2, how she would have died, how shall we that have died to sin or, or that are dead to sin, I use the grammar, have died to sin, live any longer therein or in it. The word live in verse 2 speaks of a lifestyle and the verb indicated or indicates a future tense which means an action that hasn't happened yet. So, if we're contemplating it, we need to think, wait a minute, we can't do that. We can't do that because we're dead to it. So this answers the question about temptation and everything else. We already dealt with the issue of making provisions. We dealt with that too some time ago uh, in messages taught here, and they are on Facebook as well. So we dealt with that, making provisions. So not only do we need to address the issue of living sinful in the present, but how is it possible for those who have died to sin live any longer to it in the future? This is the biblical position of sin. As I said earlier, it should be shouting news. We should be happy that we have been freed from this. People running around claiming that they're under bondage and they want to be free. And I'm set free and all. Well, I want to be free. Well, here's your freedom. You've already been set free. You don't believe it. So you shackle yourself in your willfulness to keep sinning, a position that God has freed us from, saved us from, rescued us from, delivered us from, and running around, you know, grabbing all kinds of sin, making excuses, justifying it, and badgering people who out of love are trying to correct our stupid behinds. And our pride and ignorance, our love for sin, prevents God from even sending anybody there to help us because we don't want to help. And we constantly refuse to accept the fact we are doing what we're doing because we want to do it. And that's it. If a person professing Christianity is truly saved, then it will radically affect the way he or she deals with sin. We have died to any service to the former lifestyle of sin through the saving work of Christ Jesus. So why is it that people are always running around 
stumbling as they call it. The Bible doesn't call it that. Okay, the Bible never calls sin stumbling. The Bible calls sin sinning. Yeah, write that one down. The Bible doesn't call sin stumbling. The Bible calls sin sinning. And it's always willful. It's always a choice. And our idea of God always forgiving us, a lot of it is warped. Because if we're so quick to want to say God has forgiven us of a sin that we want to do, why don't we just say that God has forgiven us of sin and has delivered us from it in the first place, which is what the Bible actually teaches. There's just no way to justify believers living in sin. No way. You can, I don't care who you listen to. I don't care who you follow, what lie you tell yourself, or what lie you adapt from other people lying to you. And they can say, oh, how would he's, you know, he's a this, he's a that. Let me tell you something. You stand in the presence of the Lord, you think Howard is, is impartial? You better wake up. You better read and believe that Bible. God respects no man's person. And if he has sent his own son to give us his freedom, you best believe he's going to be very angry at those who just walk, you know, and tread on the face in the blood of Christ. As a common thing, the writer of Hebrews makes mention of that. God isn't playing. We play too much in church, and God isn't playing. And we, uh, we be a first-class, bona fide, prime, grade fool to think that God thinks like we think. It is impossible for those who are physically dead to act as if they were alive. You would agree with that, right? I mean, that I, I shouldn't even have to ask the question. That's obvious. If, some, you know, if something's dead, they're not going to be alive. No one with an ounce of sense would believe that a person who is physically dead is living as if they were not dead but still living. That's, that's a fair statement, right? Does that make sense? Okay, because you look a little... Okay, let's try it again. Let's try it again, maybe a little slower here. Hmm. No one with an ounce of sense, and I know you have more than that, okay, would believe that a person who is physically dead is living as if they were not dead, but still living. Okay. It's a long way of saying to, I try to reach everybody with, you know. All right. You would rightfully question the sanity of that person to think that someone is dead, is actually alive and living as if they weren't dead. Right? I would immediately. Without even, you out of your mind. That's what, the first things out of my mind, you out of your mind. You crazy. What's wrong with you? You would question their sanity. You wouldn't go, hmm, let me contemplate whether what they're saying makes sense to me. You know, you would say that person is a nut job. Hope you would. If not, let me know because I'd question you before that person. I already know that person's crazy. Well, it is just as absurd to suppose that a Christian should desire to live in sin as that a dead man should put forth the actions of life. Why not? <clears throat> we don't appreciate what God has given us. I don't understand why professing whatever is finding the truth so hard to grasp unless one has not died to sin. That is, one is not a believer at all. I, 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 this should be, for some, for all of us really, even as a reminder or new for many, one of the greatest liberating messages of truth that God has ever given us. If you're running around claiming you want to be rescued, delivered, free from bondage, free from the devil, free from your mama, free from whatever, this, what Paul's saying in Romans 6 is for you. You're free. You have been set free. Your chains are broken. They're gone. Don't try to get them back. Do you want freedom? Then stop saying you want it. And then when you're offered it, you don't want it. Well, then I'm going to just assume you don't want it because your actions say you don't want it. The getting mad at me or anybody else doesn't change the fact. I don't see why people have a problem with this. And when I say that, I do not mean by any notion of perfectionism. And frankly, anyone who would even bring that up in this clear discourse is doing so as a deviation or a diversion to the simple fact that the text states that we have 
clearly died to sin. I mean, why would you even bring it up? And then why would that be wrong to want to live as God commanded the church anyway? Be you perfect, for I am my heavenly Father is perfect. And the word perfect can't mean complete because the, the issue of perfection or completion is not issue with the Father. It's crazy. He's saying live like the Father is. And that's as perfect as you can. We need to strive for that. We have to make excuses. We're to strive for that. And that means you have to cut out, a, just have to die to you. That's what it means. Instead of cutting this out, cut, cut you out. Just die. Be dead already. Dead to sin, dead to you. Be alive in Christ. Because that's what the Bible says. I don't know what kind of salvation people are believing today. I just find it, for the most part, something so foreign from the Bible. And I blame the pulpit primarily. You know, for years she has had a very clear and salient message of repentance and people understood it. Um, I blame the evangelists for the most part too. Um, they too had the same message and they associated that they need to repent because if you listen to old evangelistic preaching in the 50s and the 40s and beyond and maybe up until mid-60s, most of the times they always say, you need, you're going to hell. You need to repent of your sinfulness. You need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ or you're going to be in hell. Perfect, simple message. I mean, everything was clear. Then it began to get real foggy. Now anybody's profession means everything or anything. And it really means nothing. Because profession was never the means of salvation. Christ is the means of salvation. We don't seem to get that. My profession doesn't save me. Christ saves me. Because my profession, listen to me, my profession does not translate into genuine saving faith. True faith, belief, translates into saving faith. In the object, not in my profession. People believe, they think they're Christians because the object of their faith is their profession. The object of their faith isn't Jesus. See what I'm saying? A lot of folks, when you question about their salvation, immediately they go to their profession. And I, at that time, you want to just kind of listen to what they're saying. Just learn. Sometimes you have to learn lessons. Just listen to what they're saying. And I went this, and, and I saw Greg Laurie, or whoever, or the Grahams, or whomever, or whatever, and I went down the aisle, and I repeat. And you just listen and learn, listen and learn. Let them get out their system first. And then you say, sounds to me like you're your alleged claim to redemption or salvation is in your profession. Is that what you're suggesting? Because I've asked you, and that's all you've said. You've given me all, all this thing about your profession. Everything is about your profession. Well, yeah, well okay, I just want to know because I asked you a question, and you're giving me all this thing about your profession, so the point of your faith is in your profession and not in Christ. You didn't say you believed in Christ. You just said you went down the aisle and you said this or that. So the point of, the point of contact to your alleged conversion is in your confession, what you say, not the work of Christ. A lot of people believe that. But today you can't even question that. But I, I do. But you, you supposedly not be, you're, you're supposed to accept a person's confession at face value. Why? If you care enough for souls and you recognize the consequence of their of their profession or their false faith is hell and the lake of fire. If you really cared about people, would you be concerned about them being mad at you rather than God being angry with us because we've been entrusted to proclaim the gospel? Is it okay for you and me to be misunderstood and maligned for a little bit? The possibility that soul may be saved, may come to the knowledge of the truth. I think, it, I think it's worth it. As I said earlier, I'm not auditioning for anything. I'm not auditioning for the preacher of the month or the preacher of the year or the like me preach. I, none of that matters. What matters is that you know the truth and believe it. Because that's true of all of us. And I'll say this now as I said earlier. Instead of, you know, making stuff viral that's stupid, you ought to put something on there that's viral that's going to help the souls of men and women. Make this viral. Do that. Instead of putting up some recipes, I said, which you probably don't, don't fix, you know, or, or some cat video. Oh, you hate cats. No, I don't hate cats. I just don't care about them more than the gospel or your dog either or some 
bunch of Negroes acting like Negroes in whatever city beating up on each other. We don't need to see that stuff. Give somebody some hope. And hope isn't in Harley. It's in the message of the gospel that's being preached. If you don't like me, fine. Put somebody else up there. Make that viral. Put something up there that's truthful. that's going to help somebody. To object to the text being dead to sin with mental objections as if the state that the text does not mean clearly what it says is sin. And it's absurd. The text means what it says because God means what he says. And that should be a great reason to live a life of freedom rather than a life of bondage to sin that we live being lost. It makes no sense. If a person truly recognized their life of sin was bondage, and it was, that same person who would scoff at freedom, one would have every right to question the validity of their profession and any claim to sanity. <laughs> I would. It is not possible for anyone who has experienced grace to live as a habit of life or be living in sin. And when people get found out, they just want to start making excuses or defending. Or, well, you ain't, you ain't filling the blank. What does that matter? You have been free. Don't you want freedom? I think a lot of folks are just lost in the church. They're lost in the professed church, period. This is what God says in his word, and I do not care at all what you or I have to say about it and our objections to the truth. In this blessed state are both sin and absurd. One writer said, to be dead to a thing is a strong expression denoting that it has no influence over us. A man that is dead is uninfluenced and unaffected by the affairs of this life. Someone is dead has no is not affected by what goes on around him or her because they're dead, right? I can go to the tombstone of all my relatives of ahead of me and behind me, and I guarantee you, or your relatives, guarantee or your friends, or anybody and guarantee you that those bones in those graves are not affected by me being there or anybody else or anything else around them because they're dead. He is insensible to sounds and taste and pleasures, to the hum of business, to the voice of friendship, and to all the scenes of commerce, gaiety, and ambition. That's true. When the person is dead, that's it. They're not concerned about what's in their account or do they have to pay a bill or do they have to go to work or do they buy Susie that drink? None of that matters. They're dead. When it is said, therefore, that a Christian is dead to sin, the sense is that it has lost its influence over him. He's not subject to it. He is in regard to that as a man in a grave. He is to the busy scenes and the cares of this life. Hmm. The apostle does not here attempt to prove that Christians are thus dead, nor to state in what, they, in what way they become so. He assumes the fact with that argument. Let me say it again. That's very important here. The apostle does not here attempt to prove that Christians are thus dead, nor state in what way they become so. He assumes the fact with that argument. All Christians are thus, in fact, dead to sin. See, people want to argue about, well, what does dead mean? Really? You really want to have that argument? You really want to have that discussion? You don't know what dead means? You have a serious mental problem. All Christians are thus, in fact, dead to sin. They do not live in sin, nor has sin dominion over them. The expression used here by the apostle is common in all languages. We familiarly, sometimes that word is hard, familiarly speak of a man being dead to sensual pleasures, to ambition, etc., to denote that they have lost their influence over him. We used to say that, I'm, I'm dead to that. Remember? Some of us used to, I'm just dead to that. I said that. Had to do a lot of things. This is what we 
End of quote, by the way. This is what we would call clearly an axiom or truism of spiritual life. The expression dead to sin or the principle of being dead is seen in other passages in the New Testament. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 2, for example. So the idea that, you know, Harley may be making this stuff up or nowhere else in the Bible is this death explained, well, let's just say it in Harley-esque, is absolute nonsense. Galatians 2, verse 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Listen to that. God forbid. What's the implication? The implication is, if I'm justified, and I'm, just, I'm just singing my brains out, the implication is others would see Christ as the servant of sin. I may not be getting through. Hopefully I'm getting through to you. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. How? I am crucified with Christ. Stop. What is the crucifixion? What is the end goal of crucifixion? Death. Death. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. See, the old me is dead, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, or in the body, people, they don't get it, in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah, dead to sin, alive to Christ. The life that you now live in your body, you live by the faith of the Son of God. You, you're risen. How about Colossians 3? For some reason, these passages never seem to get hold of folk, but they're there. Yeah, make this one viral. You'll help somebody. And then send them your recipe, all right? Or some dumb whatever. But do something other than just passing on more badness. And in case you're wondering why I never haven't written anything about the Baltimore nonsense, because I don't care. It's just the same old, you know, repeated habit of bad of Negroes acting a fool. And they're doing it everywhere, and they always have been. Just I don't want to get into that stuff. Let's make sure we give people something that's going to help them. If they choose uh, to want to beat up on each other, well, that's them. They're savages, animals. They're just, just the, the living, the base nature of their sinfulness. How do they get out of that? By someone holding their hand? No, by someone giving them the gospel. And they have to trust Christ and receive that gospel be free from that savagery. Colossians 3, if ye be then risen with Christ. Stop. What does that assume? You died. You are dead. Exactly. And risen with Christ obviously means risen with Christ. Christ died and rose. You were. Hello, anybody out there? You were. Come on. You were dead. Just try to check, see if we're on the same wavelength here. If you're risen with Christ, that assumes that Christ died and you're dead too. And you're risen with him because he's risen. Well, then seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. What kind of things are those then? Just look at the verse and think it through. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to send some kind of crazy signal. I'm not trying to trick you. You have to learn how to read your Bible. It's very simple. Seek those things which are above. What are those things? Oh, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Where is Christ, church? Where is he? Hello? In heaven. Okay, so what are you going to seek then? Where are the things that are above? Heavenly things. You seek things that are above. Heavenly things. Set your affections where? On things above. Is, is she the only one here today? Set your affections where? On things above. Why doesn't everybody read their Bible when I'm asking something? Set your affections what? On things above. No matter what I do, Lord, it's always the same. Set your affection on things above. What else? What else, Tabitha? Not on things on the earth. Thank you. Not on things of the earth. Why? For you are dead. Say it again. For you are dead. Say it again. For you are dead. 
And that means what? I'm dead. It means you're dead. Either it means you're dead or it doesn't. I believe what God says. Now, if you want to live a life being dead, that's fine. That's your business. I mean dead spiritually. This, this says you're dead. That life is dead. That old you is gone. So all this old us, well, you know, I'm popping up, and you look this, I'm, not, I'm nowhere. Like, if you had to know me before salvation, you wouldn't be in the same room with me at all. None of you would. You think you would, but you would not. And we laugh, we scoff, and we smirk and stuff like that. We don't really take this life that seriously. You have no idea what I was before I was saved. No idea what, I wouldn't be in the same room with any one of you. But that's, that's, you know, whatever. Your life is hid with, hid with Christ and God. Your life, your life, your resurrected life, your new life is hid with Christ and God. It's, it's done. You're dead. It should be exciting news. Maybe one day it might be. Turn to 1 Peter 2. Well, I'm excited, Pastor. Right, I, I get that. First Peter 2. Verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who what? Did no sin. Who did no sin. That's the example. So the next time some perfectionist fool would raise the question about that, remind him or her what the Bible says that we should follow his steps, who did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. He wasn't involved in evil speak, in profane, vile language. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, what? Is anyone else here besides Tabitha? Him being what? Dead to sins. Thank you, Randy. That we being dead to sins. Notice, dead to sins, plural. Should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. It's a whole new relationship. Everything is new. It's a new life. And we should be joyful about that. We should be happy about that. But apparently, most folks don't care about it. And I'm sorry to say those who don't, don't know the Lord. The principle that imputed righteousness means death to sin and living righteously is a consistent truth in the scriptures. This principle is not some foreign, limited, insignificant doctrine taught as if it were optional or not important. It is a principled doctrine of the church as taught by the apostles. So when someone calls you a fundamentalist, you thank them because that's exactly what this is. It means the principled doctrines of the church as taught by the apostles. That's my definition of fundamentalism. I don't know what yours is. You might be thinking of some denomination. I'm not. We are to abide by the apostles' doctrine, not our own. And that's been a huge problem in the church. We don't want to abide by the apostles' doctrine. We run around trying to find, you know, someone else's doctrine, especially if, if it's something we like to do or something that, you know, we are flesh like. And I, I really wonder sometimes about people. They want to keep latching on to another person. Running around trying to find some group to hang on, some person to latch on to, as if all the work of Christ, all the work of the Father, all the work of the Spirit is not enough or not significant. Well, God can use. How about God, period? Why do we have to keep saying God can use? Why don't we just learn to go to God? Try that. That would be great. He already has a plan that doesn't include 99% of the things that we keep saying he can use. We are to abide by the apostles' doctrine not our own. We don't have a biblical right, authority, or business changing what they wrote or altering it to please myself or to please other people. We don't have any right at all. 
Jude stated that this is nothing other than turning the grace of God, as we saw this morning, into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. One writer said, quoting, the apostle is very full in pressing the necessity of holiness. He does not explain away the free grace of the gospel, but he shows that connection between justification and holiness are inseparable. And we used to teach this as the standard doctrines of the church. We now individually take the Bible and we modify it to fit us. So we don't submit to it. We have the Bible to submit to us. So we modify doctrines. We twist doctrines. I said, that, and we're going to talk about this, Lord willing, next time, but I have sense of to bring the equipment, is we don't have a high view of God. The reformers always talked about a high view of God. Now we have a low or no view of God today within the professed church. And, you know, as much as I blame the pulpits, and rightfully so, I, I must, I must administer equal blame to the people of the church, the congregations, for following such men and for searching such men out to give them what they want rather than the truth. So I have to put the blame where it belongs. Everyone has a responsibility to accept blame for this. Let the thought be abhorred of continuing in sin that grace may abound. True believers are dead to sin. Therefore, they ought not to follow it. No man can at the same time be both dead and alive. He is a fool who, desiring to be dead unto sin, thinks he may live in it. I'll repeat that last part again. He is a fool who, desiring to be dead unto sin, thinks he may live in it. End of quote. A fool. Of course you are. What else could you be? Back to Romans 6. We're going to wrap it up in a few. It's incredible how this truth just doesn't get taught. You want to end all these so-called believers in churches running around struggling and, and so-called struggles, as most of it isn't struggling at all. And I listen to some of the music because I do. I, I, that's part of the job I do. I'm not getting into it. But a lot of the things that are being played, I think, frankly, enhance this mentality. Because you never really get free. Only a few songs ever talk about freedom. Really. You know, much of the music that's being proclaimed by the so-called church today, it accentuates bondage. Oh, Lord, I'm struggling with this. Why? My question is, why? If you're having struggles about filling the blank, why? Yeah, if you're having struggles, go to God, go to Romans, believe God, here's what God said. No, nope, no. Nope. It's all this generic stuff. And we don't realize how that has infected, infected and affected our way of thinking. Infected. Like a virus. Like a disease, how this infected us and affected. You know when you get a disease, and not only inf when you get an infection, it affects you. You ever had some kind of, a, of an infection, whatever, your eye, your ear, your, it, it affects your whole body. I had an ear infection last, two years ago I think it was. Man, it affected my whole body. I had to go to the doctor. I had to get stuff. You got, it affected not only my, I think it was last year, my, you know, years passed by so quickly, you know, I feel like Colombo just kind of de deviating. But it, it started here. It affected my throat. And it got to a place where it affected actually my equilibrium. My hearing was way off. It affected my entire body. The right ear was hearing like ting ting, like someone was clanging on tin and this was all, this ear was all muffled. The right ear was crazy, high pitch. The left ear, left ear was all muffled. Doctor looks in one second, he said, yep, it's infected. Really bad. So they gave me something real powerful to get rid of that. See, if you're infected by false or errant teaching, it affects your 
body. It affects your mind. A lot of folks are around sinning. They're infected by error, by false doctrine. They need to be get that stuff out. Doctor told me one time an ear infection can kill a person. First it makes you deaf, then it makes you dead. We're infected by error so much. We have to recognize this stuff and then we have to get rid of it. And only God can do that and has done it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? <laughs> Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I, I don't know how you read that and not get it. To further emphasize the reality of the believer's death to sin and the old pre-converted life, Paul said in verses 3 through 10 that we are, we, that we now have a new identity and, and this identity prevents us from living in our former relationship. We said we're not going to go through all those verses, obviously. And this is key to understanding of who we are in Christ. What we used to be is now dead. I don't know how we keep desiring and, and supporting the things that were dead unless we are dead. Every single passion and desire and aim and goal. And remember, I have no church background at all. I have no background in Christianity. And I thank God forever that I didn't get infected by the church. I had no background at all in Christianity, religion, whatever. Every goal, every plan, every desire, every single thing that I strive for, the second I was saved, that whole life died. Everything. At that moment, the only thing that mattered was, I need to know God. Everything I was aiming my life for, everything I was doing, all my life, all my goals, all those were, God killed it. And I didn't go, what am I going to do now? I'm like, I need, I need to know who God is. That's it. That was the chief goal. So all my desire to stay in the military, dead. I need to get out of here. I need to be in a place where I can learn about God. That's it. That's it. And that was, the, that was the goal. That was the focus. So they wanted to give me a recruiting, a, a recruiting bonus. No, I didn't get out of here. Great job opportunities. Turn them all down. I need to learn about God. I need to be in a place. I knew spiritually I need to be in a place where I can learn about God. So my, my life was driven to do that. So I took jobs as they were available because I wanted to be sure to get the know this God. And I knew I couldn't do it being distracted by other things that were not necessarily the past, because God killed that life, but things that potentially would take me away from the time to get the focus on who he is. And that's what happened. And all along the way, since 1976, I've probably found a handful of people have had that desire, but they all claim to know the Lord. Everybody's claiming to know the Lord, but they're still living in that, in that past. Like that past is not, not dead. And I've gone to thousands of people and said, what does this mean? I, 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 you know, I, I'm not even going to tell you the kinds of names people call me. By just asking them a simple question. Are you dead yet? Are you really dead is dead, dead? Dead means dead. I don't know what else you think it means. And why anybody would persecute or ridicule people that are trying, encouraging us to follow hard after God. Why is that such a thing that needs to be persecuted? That just shows me the person isn't serious about wanting to know the Lord. He should be encouraged. Like, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. But no. Thank you, pastor. But no. Today it's ridicule day. Amazing. The proof of our death was the sinful life. Now that we are Christ, we are given a new identity, children of God. 
And frankly, it's time to start living like the children of God. It's time to stop being apologetic and afraid of being who we are if we are who we say we are. If I'm a child of God, I should say, I'm a child of God, I don't do that. I'm a child of God, I do this. I don't apologize for being who I am. Everyone seems to have to apologize or have, you know, go through all kinds of hoops to try to, you know, just be who we, be a Christian, be a, be a believer. Stop apologizing for being, a, I'm not apologizing to anybody. Taking a strong stand for truth, I'm not apologizing for that. You, that would be, to me, that would be an absolute, deni- it would be trodden underfoot the Son of God. For me to go, eh, I know it was a dog, pig, low-down, dirty, rotten, hell-deserving, stink sinner, and that the Lord rescued me from literal death, not figurative, but literal death. And I know that he took all that away from me and put me on a new path. And now I have to set that aside to please a bunch of stupid, stinking, hell-deserving sinners? I think not. Or a bunch of so-called backslidden sinners masquerading as believers? I think not. Or have to, you know, audition to be liked by people because that's the post, the big thing, in thing now. God wants to use you. Everyone has to like you. I think not. My Bible says the world will hate you, and I'm sure that includes everybody in it. So be it. If I want to be liked, I'll do something else. Then they don't have the wrath of God to deal with. I think not. I think I'll do just what I'm going to do. That old sinful nature that once held the believer in bondage is now destroyed because of his union and identification in Christ. The believer is in a new reign of grace. He has been removed from the power of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son, Jesus Christ. Once and for all, once a person receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by faith, that person is identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Remember that. It's not just going into the water and coming out. Well, baptism represents death. Baptism represents more than death. Baptism represents resurrected life, not just death. You're putting a person in the water, and you're saying by doing so, this person is buried, identified with Christ, and when they're coming out, you're saying this person is risen to newness of life. You can't have one without the other. People say, I want salvation, I want forgiveness of sins, but I don't want that new life. Well, it comes together in the same package. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Do you ever think about that? The power of God, the Father, raised up Jesus from the dead. And that same power raised us up from the dead too. Even so, we should, in the same manner that the the power of the glory of the Father raised Christ literally from the dead, in the same manner, so we also should walk in newness of life. End of story, case closed. Proved just by two or three verses that multitudes aren't living this way, claiming to be believers, and yet want to argue with the preacher. And it's argue with the preacher day. What the world does he know about anything? And then what does the preacher do? <laughs> well, I better, you know, uh, I better not. You know, I've been an upset so-and-so because, you know, they, they got the mortgage to the house. They got the, you know, they got the note to the car. Honey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Forget all that. I'm not going to forsake my Savior to satisfy people or a group of people or the devil or me. I don't deserve anything anyway. And neither does anybody else. 
and we truly have received this grace, we need to be thanking God for it. We need to be walking in newness of life and showing God we really, really, really appreciate what he's done for us. Period. Last time, last reference rather, since we identify with Christ's sufferings, his sacrifice for our sins, then we also identify with the new life that he gives. When Christ died on the cross for sinners, we died to sin's bondage. He was buried, so were we. He was raised from the dead, and because of that, we are also raised from spiritual death by God's power to walk in newness of life. Newness of life is the spiritual life of the living. It's what it means. It's not the life of the dead. It's the life of the living. It is the new life that was given to those who are justified. So there is no old life. Well, the old man, you know, we, we are dual natures. I wish to God the people would stop saying that. Our old man has been crucified with Christ because that's what the Bible teaches. See, we just don't want to die. So we have to, as I've said for decades, accommodate doctrines to accommodate people who simply don't want to be dead. Well, we're wrestling with the old nature and the new nature. Our old man was crucified with Christ. That's what it says. What old nature? Incredible. With eight million tapes of all these speakers that we like to hear, but our Bible stays closed and dusty because we don't want that life to die. And then the sad tragedy is we miss all this wonderful spiritual life, a life which we've never experienced because we're so busy trying to hold on to death and this wonderful life that is just waiting for us to experience. Wow. Then we go, you mean to tell me I was so stupid that I held on to this and I missed all of that? And I go, yep. Amazing. There is no old life. That life is dead. The only life for the believer is newness of life in this verse, in all this chapter. The reality of the newness of life seen many, many times in this epistle. Wow. All right, that's it. I'm done. I've said enough. And uh, hopefully this will all sink in one day. And we will learn to uh, give God the glory he deserves by walking in the life that the death of his son produced for us and gave to us. Someone had to die that we could live this life, and that someone is Christ. Lord, thank you again for your mercies and your grace. I pray that, Lord, we're just not students of Scripture, but livers of your word, living the word that you proclaim, that you, Father, command us and lovingly urge us to submit to. Thank you again, Lord. And may this word touch many, many hearts, beginning with our own. And Lord, thank you for your grace again. In Jesus' name, amen. For those who are watching, um, I just want to beseech you again, give this message to somebody. All these folks in your sphere of influence claiming to be struggling from whatever, just give them the truth and and live the truth, give it to them, and maybe, just maybe, somebody will embrace this and uh, their life will be changed as a result of it. Lord willing, next time, Lord willing, always, um, we'll be here and going back to Revelation and uh, on those rare occasions where my brain slips up, there's always truth. You never tune in to hear and, and don't hear the word. So regardless, there's always going to be Bible. So may God bless you. And Lord willing, next time, Sunday at 11 and 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. God bless. <laughs>